Encourage, engage, empower, save. This session is being recorded. Our speaker for the session is Bernadette Del Chiaro, the Executive Director of California Solar and Storage Association. Um, Bernadette came from the, uh, or give me a sec, sorry. <laughs> Okay, so Bernadette came from the California Stoller and Storage Association in July 2013 and has built the organization into the largest clean energy business group in the state. Prior to her work at CALSSA, Ms. Del Chiaro served as the Director of Clean Energy and Global Warming Programs at Environment California, as well as Western States Regional Director for Environmental America. Since 2002, she has been a leading voice on many California clean energy initiatives, including the Million Solar Roofs Initiative, the Solar Water Heating Initiative, the continued expansion of net energy metering, the establishment of streamlined solar permitting, and the and the expansion of consumer incentives for energy storage, among other victories. She's authored several clean energy reports and has been quoted widely in the media, including MSNBC, NPR, BBC, New York Times, Los Angeles Times, and dozens of local and trade outlets. She's been a California native, graduated from the University of California at Berkeley in 1995, she lives in Sacramento with her husband, Steve, and two children. So thank you so much for coming here and sharing your knowledge with us. The floor is yours. All right. Thank you, Lauren. And thank you to um, Tim and everybody that put this event together and invited me um, all the way from Sacramento, California, uh, to be a part of it. Um, so I'm going to share my screen now. Lauren, I'm going to assume that you'll let me know if there's a problem. Um, and I'm hopeful that I won't take up the entire time talking at you, but we'll um, leave some time for questions if there are any for many of you. Um, hopefully that will be possible. So what I wanna talk about is, um, I know I'm in the sort of technology section, um, but I wanna talk about both technology and uh, activism and community engagement and how those three all fit together in a unique way with I think distributed or rooftop solar. Um, and so to kind of just level set all um, a couple of first slides we'll be just talking about the technologies that that we work on um, how they fit into the climate change solutions um, puzzle um, and then just sort of the state of that um, uh, those solutions at least here in California um, and um, you can kind of extrapolate from there of how things stand in your state or maybe you can um, ask me some questions and we can talk about where things stand in your state and I'll do my best to answer them so first of all, who, who is CALSA? Cal, we're the California Solar and Storage Association. Um, we're California's oldest and largest business group. We're made up of 600 companies um, based and working here in California uh, to build a clean energy future. We like to say one roof at a time, though um, some of our technologies are located in garages or on parking lot structures or uh, out on a farm, there's lots of different ways in which solar energy fits into where we live, work, and play. Um, and this is a, a lobby day we did with our member companies um, and their workers a few years ago before COVID. Um, but just shows you uh, just some of the enthusiasm with which we kind of bring to the work we do um, here at Kelsa. Um, then just real quickly, when I talk about local solar and storage, what am I talking about? I'm talking about, first of all, um, generating electricity at the point at which the electricity is used. So that is primarily done through photovoltaics, right? Turning electricity, uh, sunlight into electricity. Um, we are more and more turning that electricity and storing it into a battery. Um, and then the other form of um, solar energy is solar heating um, and mostly primarily through water heating. Um, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. And then actually the fourth piece of our little puzzle of the world is energy controls. So we'll talk a little bit about that um, as well, uh, but it's a key, key piece of the, of the, of the, uh, of the puzzle. Um, so I'm sure most of you um, already know what solar photovoltaics are. I'm not gonna spend the whole time talking about um, photovoltaics, but. They were invented amazingly long ago, 1954. It's amazing to me that we're only now starting to see um, solar deployed in places like sunny California, 
and all throughout the country at meaningful levels. Um, we're about maybe 10% of uh, California ratepayers having solar panels on their roof or on their property in some way. Um, so 10% is great compared to zero, uh, but obviously it's really small compared to 100 and we're just really getting off the ground, even though this technology was invented so long ago. Um, you guys all, I'm sure, are familiar with the different types of photovoltaics. These are some of the main kinds at the top, the most familiar that you see, um, you know, encased in glass and aluminum up on roofs. Um, we are also starting to see some development of pretty exciting other ways of um, deploying this type of technology um, in, in things like glass and build really truly building into the entire building envelope or other uh, built environments. So, there's, uh, we like to say the sky's not even the limit <laughs> when it comes to solar energy and um, we'll see where um, the future takes us if we keep supporting the market. Um, another form I mentioned earlier, we all, most of us have a fossil fuel power plant in our garage. It's called a water heater. Um, some of us use natural gas, uh, primarily here in California, um, elsewhere on the East Coast, uh, people have borne oil uh, to heat their water. Um, and this is actually a significant source of air pollution and GHG emissions. Um, we have this other option, uh, which is solar water heating. And you can see here on the photo on the left, um, there's a typical PV panel in the background. And then the foreground is a solar water heating. It's very simple. The photo on the right shows the copper pipes. Um, you run either water or more commonly glycol through that. And then that through a heat exchange heats up water basically preheats it so you don't have to use that fossil fuel power plant in your garage if you don't, um, and in order to just take a hot shower. So it just does a tremendous amount of work heating that water up way hotter than you would ever need it for your, you know, cooking or uh, cleaning or bathing or what have you. Um, and then fun cool thing is you can also use hot water to cool things. So there's also actually cooling technologies um, that are applied um, in places around the country um, to do the, the work that um, an air conditioner otherwise does. And then energy storage, I'm sure many of you are familiar with this. Uh, Tesla is one of the most common and well-known companies providing energy storage. Um, the photo on the right is a school um, that has several of these um, large um, battery packs. Um, and then the photo on the left is an LG Chem battery. Um, that is uh, one cool fact I um, like to share is that LG Chem manufactures batteries um, right here in the United States and in, in Michigan near Detroit. Um, and they of course have located their factory close to Chevy um, so that they can put those batteries into the Chevy Bolt. Um, but a lot of those batteries, exact same technology that's going into EVs is also going right into our homes in, the, in this form of this particular box here that you see. Um, and that's the second highest selling um, battery uh, storage company in the US. Um, I also like to just sort of get people to understand that energy storage does many, many things. Um, um, we're kind of most commonly think of it, at least out here in California, we, where we're facing increased number of blackouts due to uh, climate change risks from wildfires. Um, the batteries obviously help store that sunlight during the day, and then you can actually rely on your battery for when the lights go out. Um, but it does many, many other things. I'm not gonna go into each one of these things, but there's actually 13 different services uh, that a battery that's located behind the meter and paired with a solar panel uh, can provide to our shared electric grid. So we can talk about that more later if you want, but I just wanted to share this idea that energy storage is the, it's the real kind of um, bridge to uh, complete uh, clean energy living. And one of the cool things that energy storage can do from a climate change perspective um, is it can help us decarbonize the electric grid. So this is a lot of numbers, um, but just to share it with you, show, kind of break it down. You can see in California um, that in the months of March and April, you know, mid in the middle of the day, we have actually green is uh, low carbon and red is high carbon and yellow is somewhere in between. So this is just a snapshot of the carbon intensity of the California grid. It's an average and you know all that, but it's an interesting view for electricity and energy regulators that are trying to decarbonize. As you can see, um, middle of the day in March and April, we have the greenest electricity coursing through the California electric grid. In contrast, August, September in the, in the evening is when we have the dirtiest energy coursing through the electric grid. The reason for this is both a 
great thing. It's a success. And then it's a, a where we're kind of need to keep working. The green is because we have a lot of solar energy, both utility scale and distributed. And in March and April, we have pretty relatively cool months and tons of sunshine in California, up and down the state. There's not a lot of cloud cover here in those months. And so the huge percentage of our electricity comes from solar panels and during, during those um, midday um, um, uh, and during those months. And it's really, really clean. Then you fast forward to the, um, the evening in the hotter months of August, for example, and you have the sun has, you know, is set, setting, it's lower on the horizon in August than it is. Um, and, uh, and we're relying more on what are called peaker natural gas power plants that are turned on just to meet the energy needs later in the evening. Now the energy usage is higher midday because everybody's at work and they're cranking their air conditioners, but later in the evening, our supply doesn't quite yet match in terms of renewables. So the beauty of energy storage is you can literally take some of that green surplus electricity in the middle of the day and you can shift it into the evening. What's also important to see though is those August, if you look at that August column, there's not that much green. There's a tiny bit of light green peeking in there uh, in the middle of the morning, but mostly it's, it's pretty carbon intensive. We need to build more solar panels in order to you know, put, keep greening up our grid. And then we need to pair it and build more batteries so we can make that solar uh, energy shine basically in the evening. So this is just, again, a bird's eye view of California and where our uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions come from. It's gonna be a slightly different profile wherever you are in the United States. Uh, but as one of the largest producers of greenhouse gas emissions in the country, this is an important pie to be looking at. And you can see here, 72% of our GHG emissions come from basically transportation and electricity generation. So this is where if we really want to get at carbon reductions, we've got to address these two segments. So where in terms of, we know in terms of our transportation, it's all, you know, it's all coming from gasoline powered cars and, and gasoline and diesel uh, powered trucks. Um, we need to obviously deploy more non-fossil fuel vehicles. And California has set a goal recently of um, getting to zero internal combustion engines sold by 2035. Ambitious goal, but frankly, the climate science tells us we need to do even more, even better, even faster. But in the meantime, we have to make sure that we're greening up the grid so that to the extent that some of those cars are electric, they're being powered by renewable electricity and we're really shrinking the overall and not just shifting uh, GHG emissions around. And here you look, we've made a lot of progress. 30% of our electricity um, in the course of a year is renewable, which is terrific. And it's got a nice blend of biomass, geothermal, small hydro, solar, and wind. Um, but that still leaves 70% that isn't renewable uh, or it isn't very clean. Um, and you can see the unspecified at the bottom as those are a lot of imports, uh, which are gonna be predominantly fossil fuel as well. So we have a long way to go. Um, what's the size of California's solar market? You know, it's, it's huge when you think about it in terms of like a nuclear power plant, which is a large, large uh, plant, huge source of electricity. As you can see here, um, the non-residential is sort of the commercial rooftop market, residential is homes, and then you have the utility scale market. If you add those together, uh, we have quite a good sized solar market, which again, you could see um, you know, here, a decent dark blue line at the bottom. Um, and it's a lot of nuclear power plants um, basically spread out throughout the state of California. Um, and, but in, and one of the things I'm really excited to, that we, we accomplish, have accomplished, is we've built a million individual solar systems over the course of 13 years. And that's not accounting for like the equivalent or anything. That's literally a million different solar systems on different properties uh, throughout the state. And we're actually actively building 400 solar roofs every single day is the rate of growth, um, which is about an equivalent of a coal plant every five months. So it's tremendous what we're doing, the growth and what we've created. But again, we still have a long way to go. Um, who's going solar? I think this is really important. And most people think of that bottom middle, that it's all the, you know, um, hybrid EV drivers, single family homes. And that is a big, huge part of our market. 
um, but we also have uh, over 2,000 schools with solar. Uh, we have over 2,000 farms with solar, uh, myriad commercial properties, low-income uh, rental housing properties that are also going solar and sharing those benefits with renters. Um, and then, of course, we have our new solar homes mandate. So every single new single-family home in California must come with solar panels on the roof. This is one of my favorite facts, and especially for any of you who are um, you know, not in California, maybe in the middle part of the country. Uh, California is kind of a microcosm of the rest of the country. Uh, we have our coastal cities, but we have our inland areas that are very rich in oil and agriculture and very conservative. We have actually seen four times as many people go solar, like literally on their building, on their home, on their business in Kern County, which is sort of like California's Texas, than we have seen in San Francisco. Um, so you can see the numbers here, 32,000 people have gone solar in Kern County versus 7,000. Some of that is San Francisco's really foggy. There's a lot of folks that rent and are kind of transient, right? A very young population. Um, but a bigger part of that reason for that disparity is that people all throughout California and all different stripes of politics and location of where they live they all embrace solar energy. It's, it's a, it's a non-win-win, no-brainer thing for people to invest in, and we're seeing that investment happen throughout the state. Um, another thing I'd like to share with folks about solar is um, who's, who else is going in terms of, is it just for the rich, uh, or actually because of our drop in prices, um, how, you know, we, how are we doing about getting solar into the hands of everybody? And as you can see here, and this chart needs to be updated, but it would only have gotten better over the past few years, we're having steady, steady growth of the share of the pie of those 400 systems every day are in low and moderate income uh, neighborhoods. And we've done more uh, over the past few years to try to get it again into the hardest to reach, which are low income affordable housing projects in our, in our urban cores and other disadvantaged communities. One of the things is important to know is going solar at the distributed level, again, that we're focused on is really fast. So if you're speeding against climate change and you want to transition to clean energy as fast and efficiently as possible, incorporating solar panels into our built environment and adding a battery is the fastest way you can decarbonize the electricity sector. It takes at least six years for a large utility scale project to be built it takes us six weeks and that's a generous timeline. We try to get it done even faster than that. Um, another thing I like to point out is just the diversity of the solar industry. Um, this is a quick analysis we did last year of CalSIS 600 members. And um, you can see a large percentage and growing percentage are minority owned, women owned, veteran owned, worker owned um, or union. Um, and uh, about 40% are in these uh, minority categories. And the reason is the solar industry is extremely local. So um, the jobs are mostly in the construction side of the business and that localization, the small business that it supports um, is really an uh, easy point of entry for, uh, for new people to come into the marketplace and start up a business and thrive. Um, our workers are also diverse, 75% are women or minorities. And then ratepayers benefit whenever somebody puts solar on their roof. Um, that's one less power plant, one less transmission line, one less substation. The utility has to build and distribute all of those costs to ratepayers. So in fact, we've saved to ratepayers billions of dollars so far, just getting to our first million uh, solar roofs and avoided investments into making the electric grid bigger as we move more and more toward electricity. Um, another thing I like to point out why I'm so passionate about solar as a technology for solving climate change is it's kind of like a gateway drug as I talk about it um, for people to really look at how to make significant changes in their car own personal carbon footprint, which any one of us alone isn't going to solve climate change. But if you think about it in the aggregate, um, it's huge. And then if you think about how it kind of transitions and opens the door to other carbon solutions, uh, it can be quite powerful. So in this slide, I sort of show, you know, person goes solar on their home, makes them go, huh, let's do them better. Let's get an electric car and charge that electric car with our solar panels. 
Then you do that, you go, well, let's just kick fossil fuels out completely. Let's get rid of our gas stove, let's get rid of our gas water heater, and let's just have a zero carbon home. That in its entirety is awesome. And if we can get a million people to do that, we will take a significant chunk out of our carbon emissions and we can do it really, really fast. And we can do it in a way that saves people money. So it's just a win, win, win. Once one person goes, it also has this catalyst, catalyzing effect for the entire community in which we live. So your neighbors see you go, they talk to you about it, they then follow suit. So I think that's such a great idea. So you lead by example, your whole community then goes, say with the school. And then what we're finding is more and more elected officials are living in a community that's starting to see solar and they have it themselves, which then creates this positive feedback loop of support for getting more and more renewable energy deployed out and throughout our, our communities. And then the last point is um, about the importance of public policy. So this is where I get into sort of empowering consumers to make meaningful changes and solving climate change right now, even though the problem is so daunting. Um, but it's also about we do this through public policy. And so I, um, I hope this is a steady theme. I'm sure it is with Bill McKibben and others that have been part of the event today. But we make the biggest change when we work together and we pass laws or policies uh, that either you know reduce directly reduce our use of fossil fuels or we promote and um, accelerate our use of renewable energy. This is just a um, slide to sort of show you the annual growth of rooftop solar in California over the past 15 years or so. And I can tell you when I came to California from uh, having worked on the East Coast for some campaigns to shut down coal-fired power plants in New England, and I came back to California in 2002, my, I looked around and my job was to work for an environmental group on developing a clean energy program. And you know, at the time we had very little renewable energy in California. We um, had incredibly high amounts of great greenhouse gas emissions associated with coal-fired power plants in the um, mountain west, southwest. And we had very little rooftop. Um, really nobody had solar except for a handful of really like early, early adopters. And, um, and so we decided, I teamed up with a state senator named Kevin Murray, and we decided to just go big on rooftop solar. And so we introduced a bill in 2004, um, and you see that slight bump up in, in the market in four and five is largely due to, probably none of you will know about this, but California had an electricity crisis in 2001, 2002, where this company named Enron uh, basically manipulated the electricity supplies in order to drive up the price. And that manipulation went haywire and there were rolling blackouts all throughout the state of California in two different instances. And people paid you know, thousands of dollars in their electric bill um, for, for one month of electricity and, and really major problems throughout the state. That made a lot of people sort of fed up uh, with the system. And a lot of folks said, I'm gonna get my own solar panels and just you know do something to not, not put so much power and control into some of these energy companies and into our utilities. Um, so building off of that, we were able to pass the Million Solar Roofs Act in 2006. Um, this was something that Kevin Murray was the uh, senator of, and Arnold Schwarzenegger, who was our governor at the time, championed it and signed it into law. That bill basically transformed solar energy in California. It created a $3 billion pot of money to directly give consumers incentives to go solar. And it increased a program called net metering, which allows the meter to spin backwards and you get a credit and you can use that credit uh, on your energy bill to lower um, the energy bill. So it's a beautiful bill. It worked incredibly well, as you can see. Um, we then worked, got the federal government to uh, extend and renew the federal tax credit. So ratepayers could get a rebate, they could get uh, a, a, a credit on their taxes, um, and then they get this net metering. And from there, you just see this steady, steady growth until 2016, when the utilities lobbied our state regulatory agency and got the agency to uh, kind of give this net metering program a haircut. You can see that haircut in 2017 and 18, and we're just now climbing back up to where we were in 16. So the point I wanna make here is all the technology and smart business practices in the world 
don't really mean that much if you don't have a market to sell your wares. And markets on energy are very, very dependent on public policy. It's a highly regulated, very monopolized, very centralized system. And it's very hard to get new technologies to break into that system. But with good policy, you can do it. And you can see what the effort that went into passing the Million Solar Roofs Initiative and how it helped as long, along with the federal tax credits, how those two policy initiatives helped to grow the market. We're now at a whole new kind of decade and a new um, vision that we have to now go, we want a million solar charged batteries. So we wanna do this exact same growth curve for batteries so that we can think back to that one chart I shared at the beginning, get deeper into decarbonizing California's electricity grid while at the same time keeping the lights on, providing resiliency during uh, storms like what Texas just had um, and, um, and, and basically creating jobs and a lot of economic development um, as well. And so um, for me, it isn't a question of if we'll transition to renewable energy, but when we'll do it, how quickly, um, who is gonna be part of it, um, who benefits from our transition to renewable energy, um, and how, you know, how quickly and efficiently uh, we get there um, is, is sort of the, the key question. Um, and for me, it's about smart technology that engages and, and I gotta sign these. individuals. And then it's about public policy and engagement. So with that, I'll stop and we'll see. I see there might be a question in the Q&A um, from Jacob. And he asks, what's the cheapest type of PV cell? Um, well, the thin film is really cheap. Um, it's the kind that it's, uh, you basically coat plastic um, with, uh, or some sort of flexible thin material um, with, with the photovoltaic uh, basically substrate. And then you can lay it on a roof. Um, you can uh, do lots of different things with it. But the downside of thin film is um, is that it's actually less efficient. So you need way more of the product to make the same amount of energy that those square glass and aluminum modules you see typically up on roofs. Those are very efficient and they can make more energy for the same space. So for most of our built environment, we really wanna have um, the other form of um, photovoltaic. Um, and we've seen the price come down significantly um, from it was about ten dollars a watt when I first started working on this in two thousand and four, and we've gotten our prices now down to close to three fifty a watt. Um, one of the big, big last remaining areas that we need to see to get our price down even further is what we call soft costs, and that is mostly permitting at the local level. So that's another thing. If any of you are interested in doing something in your local community. Um, you could be advocating for your local building department to adopt what's called the solar app. Um, it's developed by the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. And it's this brilliant app that basically every building department in the country can just plug into it. And then all solar installers, they submit, it's just you go to basically a portal online to submit your permit documentation to say, I'm gonna build a solar panel for Jacob uh, at his home and I, here's how I'm gonna do it. The building department gets you an automatic turnaround um, of approval to go ahead and install that system for Jacob. But that type of um, product, believe it or not, can shave the cost of solar significantly, saving consumers money um, and helping us lower prices to, to expand solar for more people. Um, all right, let me see if I got another one here. Um, Sammy says, hi, you mentioned that solar panels were actually introduced pretty early but weren't used for renewable energy until much later. Where did we first see solar panels being used for renewable energy on a large scale in the United States? Great question. Um, the history of solar is really cool. It started, that photo I showed you um, was basically Bell Labs that ran the telephone lines, the telephone company back before cell phones. They invented the, the photovoltaic cell as we know it today because back then the phone companies needed a tiny bit of electricity to get our phone calls across large distances, just a little boost. And they of course didn't wanna wire electricity from some power plants. They 
had this motivation to invent this source of electricity that could be across these wires all across the United States. Um, they ended up having a different discovery that allowed them to forego the need for the solar panel. So it sat basically on their shelves for a long time until um, basically the off-grid movement in the 1960s and 70s. So a bunch of hippies that were kind of checking out of society and going and living off the land. They basically got word of this solar panel and they bought it and they um, deployed it and they developed it to light up their little kind of, you know, backwoods homes. Um, and, and they basically perfected it and they invented the idea of a thing called an inverter that turns the electricity from direct current to alternating current so that your uh, blender, you know, or toaster oven inside the house can use it. And it wasn't until really the 1990s that we started to see solar come out of that kind of off-grid movement and start to become used and start to be deployed in homes like where we all live that are connected to the electric grid. And that got started in 1995 in California passed the first net metering law. And it's really kind of been history ever since. It got started in this really distributed way as prices lowered and demand for renewables grew, we started to see more and more utility scale projects, the huge projects out in the desert. And now our market, at least in California, is about 60, 40, 60% of these huge utility scale projects and 40% are distributed all throughout the state on roofs, um, as I kind of mentioned earlier. So hopefully it answers your question. Um, let's see, uh, Anonymous says, how would you recommend bringing up the solar panel conversation to my family? Um, it's a good question. Um, I would say that you should ask folks if, you know, your family, if they realize that they, if they went solar, that they could actually save money um, and actually keep the lights on if there's ever a disruption to the electricity grid, while at the same time doing good for the planet. Um, while some of us who are diehard environmentalists and are really concerned about climate change want to start every conversation from a climate change frame, because that's what our motivation is. I find it's really helpful to look at what the you know, recipient of the information, what motivates them. And most people are motivated by saving money um, and having reliable energy. And that is one of the two main benefits that solar panels have. And so if you get more and more people, more heads nodding of like, oh, right, that makes so much sense. Then the green part of it, the altruistic planetary part of it, it's kind of like a, you know, a bow on top. It's obviously incredibly important, but it gets people motivated to do the right thing. You can bring them along on the climate science um, after they've decided to save money with solar. So that would be one answer. Um, let's see. Uh, Kaylin asks, um, do you have any advice that would give, you would give to students trying to uh, encourage their school or families to get solar? Okay, so it's the exact same question, really. Um, you should look, you can work with uh, local experts and you should, guys should feel free uh, to email me. Let me actually put my, there we go. Um, anybody wants to, feel free to email me um, and I'm happy to try to connect you with some local experts in your hometown or in your state, uh, but there are lots and lots of services for people to get to understand if they put solar on their roof, you know, how financially viable would it be? How much money would they save in the first year, in the first five years? Um, it is most, most of the time, with a few exceptions of states that have made it very difficult for people to go solar, most of the time, it will save you money if you make that investment. And there's also lots of different financing. So you can go solar without having a huge amount of money you have to put down. Um, you can finance it, you could do a leasing type arrangement. Um, so there's lots and lots of ways that people go solar um, in the United States today. Um, okay, these are great questions and I've got lots of time. So hopefully I can get to them in a timely manner here. Um, trying to go in order, but it's a little hard to see because the timestamp is sort of different every, everywhere here. But um, Kaylin, um, you also asked, are the solar panels that you guys install in houses directly linked to the houses? So the leftover electricity is fed back or do all the houses have a battery or storage for the electricity created by solar panels? Okay, 
great question. Um, let's see, the about 90, about 80%, 80 to 85% of the solar being installed today is does not have a battery. So I remember I shared that statistic of 400 people go solar every day in California. Uh, just about 15 to 20% of those folks are adding a battery. But that's right now. And that number was probably 5% a year ago. So we're seeing a huge increase in the interest of batteries along with the solar panels. And that's great. And we're really trying to push the batteries because of all of the other additional benefits that batteries bring to the home and to the grid and to the planet. Um, but we're just starting out. In fact, batteries are where solar was about 2007, 2008. If you were to go back and look at the size of our market back then, uh, that is where we are with batteries today. So we have a long way to go still, and we're just getting kind of getting started. Um, but so what happens when you don't have a battery is you're connected to the electric grid. And as you put it, Kaylin, it, at any point in time during the day, like I have solar panels on my home right now, and it's two o'clock in the afternoon in California, it's a bright blue sky, sunny day, and I'm sending a lot of electricity back to the grid right now. That's going to my neighbors right next door who don't have solar panels, and, um, and I'm getting a credit, and that credit will then help me pay for that upfront cost I made and that investment in solar panels on my roof. Um, with a battery, which I also have, it has already gotten charged up to full. It usually gets charged up by noon, and then I, I discharge it in the evening, right, to get at that, uh, that those dirtier hours um, where the sun isn't shining anymore. Um, that's usually gets charged up completely by noon, and then it's just sitting there right now um, waiting to discharge when California's grid needs it most, which is in those evening hours. So with batteries, it's there if I need it, and then it's also discharging and helping shift that sunshine into the evening hours so that we can shut down more of those um, fossil fuel power plants. Um, okay, another anonymous question says, this is a good one. In places where it's night time, 24 seven, like Alaska, how would they go about getting renewable energy? And are there any instances at all in which solar panels would work? So great question. Solar power works basically around the globe. One of the biggest markets for solar you guys are maybe aware of is Germany. Germany has the solar energy potential of um, Northern United States and Southern Alaska. So it, it works actually everywhere around the globe. Sure, in the dead of winter in Alaska, when the sun never gets above the horizon, um, you're gonna have a hard time relying entirely on, on solar energy. And you'd have to have an incredibly large battery to get you all the way through the winter. So what we would recommend for Alaska, as is the case for California and Michigan and everywhere else, is that solar and batteries are a major kind of pillar to your renewable energy infra infrastructure and investments, but you pair it with wind, which blows year round and mostly during the night in a lot of places. Um, and then you also pair it with other types of renewable energy. So a great source for Alaska would be geothermal, and geothermal can be both big and it also can be small. So there's a lot of folks that keep their homes at a constant temperature through what's called distributed geothermal. This is pretty easy to do and it's, it's, it, it's absolutely possible um, to deploy this uh, in the significant ways. We just haven't quite made those investments yet in these other technologies like we have with solar. And then last but not least, there are these other technologies called fuel cells, for example, um, that can really store and generate electricity during the winter. So that would be my quickest answer. But of course, the opposite flip side of Alaska is it is also sunny 24 seven um, for the rest of the year during the summertime. And there you could build up a lot of uh, solar energy, store it and use it and almost be completely fossil fuel free with all of the sunshine they have up there. Um, and then they could again store it hydrogen. They could uh, get, capture hydrogen from water store it in a fuel cell uh, for the use in the winter. There's a lot of uh, places here in California that are off-grid micro uh, microgrids uh, that are 100% renewable and they get by, um, by coupling and marrying these different technologies with solar being the kind of heart and soul of the whole system, but balancing it out 
and taking advantage of the benefits of these other technologies as well. Um, do companies like your own, do companies like your own do like a payment plan for solar panels or a majority pay up front? Great question. Um, so let's see, statistically in California, 70% of the solar systems are paid for with what is considered cash. Um, and 30% are uh, financed through what's called a PPA. So let me explain what I mean by that. When I say cash, I don't really mean like you pull out a wad of money and you pay in cash. Sometimes it's, you know, literally you have that money in the bank and you pay uh, through check or otherwise. But most time people take out a loan, like a home improvement loan. Um, there's a lot of energy, clean energy loans that are available at a very low interest. Um, and you just sort of finance it like a home improvement project. Um, that's how I did it. And it's a really cheap way um, to, to not have to have all that money in the bank, um, but instead make this improvement to your home that increases the value of your home, lowers your energy bill, um, and you can finance it. Um, the PPA model and um, PACE financing is the other one. Those basically allow you to, um, um, you, you basically have a company come and own the solar system on your roof. So say Sunrun is the largest of these types of companies today. They own it, they pay all the upfront costs, and then they sell the electricity from the solar panels on your roof to you at a discounted rate. So you get a guaranteed um, lower energy bills. Uh, it's in the contract. And then your home is powered by the solar panels on your roof and you never had to fork over a penny uh, to put the solar up on your roof. Um, so that's a really popular, but like I said, about uh, 20 to 30% of Californians use it that way. And as you can imagine, you know, that is what's helping really drive that, um, that along with um, other forms of financing like PACE financing and has heavy subsidies is helping us get deeper and deeper into low and moderate income neighborhoods. Um, so let's see, do you think that a policy such as a carbon tax uh, if a policy like a carbon tax was put into place, the demand for solar would greatly increase? It's a good question. Um, I know carbon tax is really popular. We don't, as an organization, have a position, um, mostly because I haven't seen it get introduced in a, in a serious way. So I have 50 million bills I have to take positions on. I'm not gonna take position on something that's just an idea. Just That's just my reality. Um, it really depends on how the carbon tax is developed, um, who's getting taxed, and how and, and, and how much, and whether or not that would really motivate people. Again, it's all about the economics. That's what drives everything. Like it would be, we would have solved climate change a long time ago if everybody was acting in their own self-interest in terms of avoiding crises and catastrophes like what we just saw in Texas, which was clearly a climate change event, or the wildfires that you know, ravaged California in the heat waves six months ago. These are climate change events and they're hurting everybody and it's all in our best interest to reduce climate change, right? But unfortunately, we're still in this place where people think short-term and they think with their pocketbooks. So if a client carbon tax could be done in a way that truly makes an immediate impact and, and, and on people's um, daily lives in terms of the cost of living, it would probably help but, um, but there'd be a lot of consequences to that too, and a lot of pushback. So, and if you kind of structure the carbon tax in a way that only tax, say the fossil fuel industry, that wouldn't necessarily directly motivate a school or a homeowner or an apartment building to invest in solar, right? So I think it's better, not that I'm against a carbon tax per se, but I just think it's better to say, we want there to be a million solar roofs in every state in the country. And we're going to create the economics and really encourage it or put it right into building code um, to get us there. And you get the same carbon reductions and you get there without any of the un unnecessary or unexpected or unintended rather consequences or impacts. We could debate this till the cows come home, but that's just my first reaction. Um, Feel free to ask a follow-up question if that didn't seem satisfactory. Um, let's see, Denise asks, what do you predict for the future of home batteries? Right now, they're very expensive. 
but would offer a sea change in promoting e-vehicle use. Yeah, batteries right now cost, like a single home battery costs around $10,000 without incentives. And then with um, rebates that some states offer like California and then the tax credit, if you're pairing it with solar, that the federal government offers, it comes down to around $5,000. For a lot of people that are faced with unreliable electricity supplies, $5,000 is actually cheaper than investing in a big, you know, propane or diesel or uh, gasoline powered generator. So there's a lot of people in California faced with these um, blackouts that we've been faced with. And probably a lot of folks in places like Texas that are looking for how do I get my own source of energy as a backup for when the grid goes down? They're forking over probably 5,000 bucks. If they want to do anything more than run their cell phone on an itty bitty little generator, right? Or just their fridge. People want to actually have significant amounts of their lives powered. They're going to be forking over 5,000 bucks. So the argument we would make is, yes, that's expensive and we need to get the price down, but that's actually pretty good compared to the alternative, which is more fossil fuels um, and less, you know, frankly, has a bunch of other problems related to how do you get fossil fuels if it's in a crisis and blah, 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 whereas the sun's always going to be shining on your roof. So um, it's expensive. We need to get the prices down. The number one way to do that is to create the market. So the way market economics work is if demand is low, prices are high. And if demand is hot, you know, and, and so, so, sorry, supply, the demand is really, really low. Manufacturers make five of these things a year. It's gonna be really expensive to make five widgets. If we can increase demand, manufacturing capacity goes up and the price per item comes way down. This is how we've made all consumer products cheaper. So we need to apply that same market economics to energy storage. We did this for PV to great success. We need to do it for energy storage. EVs are gonna help. It's one of the reasons why we're cautiously optimistic to think we can get batteries down even you know, just as fast, if not faster, hopefully, as we got for photovoltaics. But one thing to think about is it still takes, it still takes time and then there's just the building part of it. And that's more than half the cost is the take a little truck, you run out to the house, you, you know, couple guys wire it or gals wire it to the home and then you turn it on you get your permits and your inspections and everything that all that body of work everything outside of the actual hardware the actual battery that's hung on the wall that's actually the lion's share of the cost of going solar and or storage hence our big focus on that app that solar app where if we get that the cost of getting it permitted down that can make it take a big chunk out of it and make renewable energy uh, more of a reality. So hopefully that answered your question. Okay, here we have one, another anonymous uh, question. How would you suggest addressing starting a community solar slash storage uh, distribution network on a small local level? Is it even possible? Um, yes, it's very possible. Um, basically, it's called a microgrid. Um, and uh, we have several microgrids in California and throughout the United States, but they're very few and far between, and um, they, they take a long time. They're not that fast, uh, you know, fast to deploy like a home solar system with a battery in the garage. Um, community solar is a little easier to deploy to get going. It'd probably take you about a year, year two years to get it off the ground and get it actually like plugged in and working. What community solar is, for those who aren't familiar, is you, it's harder to do with storage, but with, uh, with community solars, you basically take a, maybe a church roof or a big warehouse um, that doesn't have a lot of need for electricity under its roof, but it's surrounded by a community or a neighborhood. And if you can get the permissions set up, you can basically collectively build those solar panels on that roof and then have the electrons shared uh, sort of on paper and credit form with those homes in that neighborhood. So that's community solar. Um, some states, um, Colorado, uh, Massachusetts are two that come to mind, have really done a great job of promoting community solar. And we are seeing uh, some of those projects um, deployed. 
With a battery, it's a little harder, um, but it's still possible uh, to do it with a battery as well. Um, batteries are just funny when you think about them because with a solar panel, electricity is instantaneous, right? So the sun shines, it hits that panel and it immediately generates an electron. That electron flows somewhere. It flows to whichever is the closest uh, appliance that needs that electron. Um, and so you can kind of instantaneously um, kind of use those electrons and then credit people for every electron that's generated. With a battery, there's a, you introduce the element of time. So a battery gets filled up, like think about my home battery that I said, you know, the sun shines on my solar panels, it is full by noon. It sits there and it's, I use it from five to, to 9 p.m. So it's a time dependent resource. And I could either have it discharge all of its juice that it's stored up in the first half hour. I could go five to 5.30 if I wanted to like charge my uh, Chevy Bolt um, in a really fast way, like supercharge it, I could deplete my battery in a half hour. Or I could have that battery drain slowly over the course of four hours, which is frankly better for the battery. <laughs> um, and so there's this time dependency of storage that actually makes shared batteries with a community harder. Like how do you figure out how to spread that, you know, that wealth around? Um, and you certainly can't do it in, in an easy way if one home needs it during a, uh, an outage event and another doesn't, or, you know, it just gets harder to share. So what some companies are doing, which is there's kind of like a third uh, idea of solar and storage, which is called a virtual power plant. And a virtual power plant is um, kind of two different things, but as it relates to this community solar concept is, um, what you can do is say, take an apartment building and it's got say a hundred units and one big roof. You can cover the roof with solar panels and then you can put a battery inside every apartment. So just a little battery like that one I showed you, totally like doesn't take up that much space. And that battery is tied to each individual apartment unit, but the solar panels are community kind of shared. So each battery could, could act exactly like my battery here, right? Takes a percentage of the panels off the roof, charges it up. Now it's ready to provide either meet some of the electricity usage of the apartment later in the evening or power that apartment if the lights go out. So this is kind of essentially a community solar project because the panels on the roof are kind of communal, um, but everybody gets a battery to power their own individual needs, um, which provides all of that reliability benefit um, and all the other benefits that we talked about. I'm really excited about that idea. Um, and we're starting to see more and more of that. Um, okay, are the batteries a risk to have in every community or neighborhood? If they contain so much electricity, I can't imagine it wouldn't happen. What would happen if one were to malfunction somehow? Not sure how it compares to what we have now. Great question. Yes, batteries, are dangerous things. They are um, they are basically uh, chemist, chemist, chemicals stored tightly packed in a box uh, that are yes charged up with uh, with electricity. Um, frankly, your cell phone is dangerous. If you ever put your phone uh, made the mistake of leaving your phone in a hot car, <laughs> um, and it comes, it, I don't know if you guys have ever had that happen, where it's like suddenly starts blaring at you. And it shuts itself down and it's immediate, you know, it's like yelling at you to get it out of the hot sun. It literally could explode and start a fire. And some phones have done that. I'm sure you guys are familiar with that. So these batteries, no matter the little the tiny things that, you know, um, energizer batteries that we put in our electronics or our cell phones or our laptop computers, um, these are all um, potentially hazardous uh, products if we don't. Uh, treat them carefully and take care of them. And when it comes to a battery on your home or on a school or at a business, it needs to be properly installed, it needs to not be in the direct sun um, and um, you know all that. But actually it's pretty safe if everybody follows the standards and the rules. And so we have extensive codes in California and throughout the country and throughout the globe for electronic appliances to just make sure things are safe. So we have laboratories like UL, for example, 
on the back of every electronic device you've ever had, you'll look on the back and you'll see a stamp of approval from that lab. That means every product that's manufactured is tested to be safe for consumer use and then manufactured exactly the way the, the testing labs dictate. Um, so we could all be sure as consumers, if we go down to the store and we buy a cell phone, or if we call up our local solar installer and they install a battery, it is installed to code and it's gonna be safe to use. And we have right now in California, 30,000 batteries throughout the state. So while we're still just starting out, there's no small amount of batteries that are deployed in garages and apartment buildings, um, schools and, and elsewhere. We also have large utility scale projects with huge banks of batteries um, and they're all working safely. We have had occasional, there was a uh, utility scale project in Arizona that caught fire, um, still under investigation um, as to why it caught fire. So it's not to say that there aren't hiccups um, for the industry, um, but by and large, um, if installed properly, um, it can be safe. So um, one other thing to think about, about battery safety is, uh, you know, I just drove uh, an hour uh, back home from a little um, trip I took out of town today in my electric car. I took that same size battery that I have on a wall, came in stationary in my garage. It's basically on four wheels and goes 60 miles per hour down the road. <laughs> um, we are driving in little metal boxes and, you know, hurling these batteries through a time and space um, at an increasing rate. Um, and if these things were that dangerous, um, we would all be in a, a whole, you know, world of trouble with all the EVs that are, you know, driving around, um, around our communities right now. So it's not to say it's not, there isn't some risk and that there isn't uh, some, a safe, strong safety culture that we have to adhere to, um, but, uh, but it's not as dangerous as you might think. And the last thing I'll say on this is, um, if you think about the volatility of fossil fuels, how incredibly dangerous a uh, compact tank of gas is, or your electric, your, I mean, your natural gas water heater in your garage, um, these are actually appliances that are come with a lot of risk and, um, and can be very, very deadly or damaging to property by the same exact standards of a lithium ion battery, other forms of energy storage. Um, could solar panels work with moonlight? That's so cool. I Sometimes we get a really bright, 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 clear night here in California and I go out and I can see the moonlight on my panels um, and I want it to actually work, but no, it needs um, direct rays from the sun uh, to, to work. Um, so unfortunately we can't make solar energy out of moonlight, but maybe someday we'll engineer such a cool solar cell as to be able to do that. Um, let's see. So also it looks like a chat. Uh, let me see if there's any other questions there. I think that, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I think that unfortunately we do have to we do have to wrap up at this okay. at this point in time. I think Lauren wants to say just a couple of things before we before we head out. Um, but thank you so much. Of course. Yes. So, uh, Miss Del Chiaro, thank you so much for sharing your Saturday and your knowledge with us today. And we really appreciate you taking the time to be here. I'm sure everyone has learned a lot. I know I certainly have. Um, and we just really appreciate you being here and taking the time to talk with us today. Of course. Thank you for the invitation and keep up all the good work you guys are doing and be in touch if you have any other follow up questions. Thank you. Thank you.